Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Machiko Haver, and I'm the EDI Initiative Associate at TCG. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of TCG and to go over a quick few um, housekeeping items. This session has captioning and ASL interpretation available, and we'll be dropping instructions on for how to take advantages of those resources in the chat. Um, I'm here to help support logistics today, as are Amelia Smart Denson and Sam Morreale. So if you are having Zoom trouble or you have any questions, feel free to private message any of us. And we'll also keep an eye on the chat and also the Padlet link, which we will drop, um, which is where you can uh, drop some questions that you may have for our panelists today. Um, so just a reminder to keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. Um, and again, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat or into the Padlet. Um, I also want to let everyone know that TCG is recording um, parts of this session. So, and with that, I'm going to bring Clementine Bordeaux uh, to join me and hand the session over to you. Hi, everyone. So I will be moderating the roundtable today and kind of leading the discussion. Uh, my name is Clementine Bordeaux. I'm C. Changu Oglala Lakota, and I'll put that in the chat. Uh, and I'm calling in from uh, Ocheti Shakhoin territory, which is in the South Dakota region. And I'm calling in from Mini Luzaha Otumahe, which is Rapid City. So if the interpreter was having trouble spelling any of that, I just put it in the chat. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, we. Um, I include we because as a Lakota person, uh, our pronouns aren't, we don't have pronouns in Lakota and often our pronouns are relational. So that's why I add the we. And uh, a brief descri visual description of myself. I have red-ish hair. I have yellow glasses on uh, and a lavender scarf. So. Um, if you're looking for me in the little visual boxes, that is where I am. So I am going to let the panelists introduce themselves and I will just put in the chat the order and then I'll let them take it away. Hi, uh, let me see. Okay, name. Uh, my name is Oyeme Duchess Davis, R.O. Um, right now, I am a playwright at the National Black Theater in New York and um, the Lark Theater in New York. Oh, my bad. Okay. Um, my pronouns, I use they, they, them pronouns. Um, visual description, I, I kind of look like a pirate right now. <laughs> uh, land acknowledgement, uh, I am in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so that's the Dakota tribe. And one phrase that describes my practice, uh, transformative, yeah. Thank you, Oyame. Ellen? Bon Guinzi, Shoji, Tate, Tom, Shankovitz, and Dick Cherjik, Soldai Goods, and Dicky, that's a Nohadi, Dick and Jigwin Kloshoi, Lima Sicho, Nohai Chani, Than. My name is Alan Hayton. I am Athabascan, which in from Arctic Village, and happy to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm calling from Fairbanks, Alaska, which is Lower Tanana Dene land. Um, my pronouns, Athabascan also doesn't have pronouns, uh, he, she, they, um, but I go by he, him. And, um, <clears throat> visually, I have a goatee, very standard for Athabascan people. <laughs> You can't grow a full beard, so we grow it around here. <laughs> and um, 
Um, one word to describe my practice, play. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Alan. James? My name is James E. Burnside. I am, uh, um, I don't know where to start. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of the Coahuilatecan, the Lipan Apache, the Tonkawa, the Humanos, and the Comanche. Uh, I am a white male, he, him, his. Uh, I have gray hair, I have big ears, I'm wearing uh, large glasses for reading and a black and white t-shirt from Tilt Performance Group. And I'm a disabled vet and a playwright. Cool. Thank you, James. So thinking about um, both the theme of the conference and thinking about uh, how important climate change is for the world and our work. Um, the first question that I would like to start out with, and I'll put this in the chat as well, um, is how would you define theater ecology for yourself and for your work? Uh, and we will start with you, Oyame. Okay, so uh, the way that I, I like kind of uh, describe e ecology is it deals with uh, the relations of organism and how they relate to one another and then also relate to their um, uh, to the environment. So the way that I do that is a very, uh, I guess I use a very sociological lens um, in my playwriting. So for example, the way I would, um, I would like write a play about uh, like a low income family being like uh, affected by like an incinerator or something. And it shows both how uh, things that we're setting up in our society are both affecting low income people and also affecting the environment at the same time. Um, yeah. Thank you. Alan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I was looking at the theme of the conference and the work that I do. Lately, I've been <clears throat> involved with playback theater, which involves uh, it's a applied theater form and involves a conductor, actors, musicians, and an audience who um, an audience member will share a story and then the company plays back the story. It comes from the theater of the oppressed uh, school. And <clears throat> it, you know, there's a cross section of all different types of people, depending on who's in the audience. We've been doing a lot of work with the Fairbanks Youth Facility. Um, that is up until the pandemic, like most theater is uh, virtual now. Um, but <clears throat> when I was looking at the theme of the conference, that's what I was uh, trying to relate to the work that I've been doing lately the last few years. Thank you, Alan. James? Well, I, I'm an inveterate researcher. So uh, the first thing I did was uh, do an internet search of theater ecology, because it was not, a, it's a phrase I'd heard, but was not familiar with. Um, I didn't like anything I read. It didn't speak to me. Um, you know, I'm thinking about where our, where the, where my, the theater I'm involved with, Tilt Performance Group, which is a, a theater group comprised of persons with disabilities. Um, we uh, we're, we're virtual like most theaters, but I don't think of that as theater. For me, theater needs, it needs to be live. I need to 
for me, I need to see the person, feel the person, be in the same, breathe the same air. And it feels to me right now like theaters have been like, I mean, this is a very ancient medium and it feels like it's like an old growth forest that's been burnt to the ground. And, and you know, the big trees, the, the, the strong trees will survive and put out new leaves and are putting out new leaves and, and will regrow. The smaller trees may or may not survive. And, but new things will grow from the soil. Um, I'm waiting to see what will grow from the soil. Um, I don't know that it'll be vastly different than the theater we had before. Um, but I would like to see it somewhat different. I'm, I'm you know, my, my, our little theater Yes, we did some virtual performances, but we also started a, an education program for everyone in the company. We called it Tilt You, and we did dramaturgy and sta uh, you know, stagecraft. And uh, well, I, I led a playwriting organization group and you know, acting companies. And, and, and um, you know, we educated ourselves about what theater was and is. And uh, I hope that continues. I think that's something valuable. Listening to all of you, I know I had, you know, set up questions to really think about um, the theme, but also considering these intersections of race, class, gender, place, um, and, but in addition, you all seem to touch on the impact of COVID as well. And I think for kind of furthering this discussion, if you can, one, describe how your work addresses these intersections, right? And we're thinking about climate change and climate shift, right? Our physical environment. But I also think about the impact of the climate of being in relation, right? Oh yeah, you said, um, right, thinking about ecology is a relation to each other. And the same with you, Alan, like this playback, it needs an interaction. And James, like you, you know, theater needs to sometimes be in person. We need that audience, you know, response. So how would you all describe like first the intersections of these? And then I think just since COVID is on our mind and we have communities across the globe or, that are still being impacted, um, with really immense devastation, like what are the ways that your practice has shifted because of that? So Oya May, if you can start us off. I, I feel that um, just, just not with, with COVID, but because a lot of people are being sort of, uh, I guess, forced to, um, and not able to connect and stuff it's kind of brought in um theater i guess to me in a way because i spend a lot have to spend a lot of time at home just because of my disability so i feel like in ways um being able to do zoom and stuff i feel like i've i've gotten uh to i i've gotten to connect with people and other theater uh, people in ways that I haven't gotten to in in a while and uh, just like but but then like and and that's helpful I guess um, especially just when it becomes to like all the uh, all the devastation that's been going on lately both with people dying of COVID and then uh, black and Asian and other people of color being like murdered and stuff, whether it be by the police or racist people. So, I mean, it's it's a way for us to, um, uh, I feel like COVID has kind of provided me a way to connect with people and then other disabled people to connect and then us all to connect together during such a devastating time, yeah. Thank you, Alan. 
I don't know if it worked, but I used the Padlet to send a link. There was a, <clears throat> a photo on Facebook I just saw this morning, and it's a village here in Alaska, Buckland, that is currently underwater. And I think it shows very clearly the impact that climate change is having here in Alaska. Alaska is an area that globally it's being impacted at a higher rate. Um, you know, it's like a preview of what's to come for the rest of our world. And uh, there's also warming temperatures here in Alaska. So we're just, we're, we are seeing all of these effects um, that are going to be shared with the rest of the world. You know, it's a harbinger of what's to come. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's often on my mind, how are we going to endure and see future generations thrive if we don't address these issues and they're, they're mounting and I am a little bit um, hopeful, but also that's sort of um, tempered by <laughs> our recent experience with COVID where people refuse to wear a mask, for instance, and just refuse to make their individual contribution to the greater good, um, calling it tyranny or, you know, it's, it's just a simple mask and you know, it's intended to help others and to protect yourself but um, if we can't take a simple step such as that, how can we make these larger uh, adjustments that we're going to need to do um, for the future? I grew up in Arctic Village and Arctic Village has been uh, really working for many years to protect the birthing grounds of the porcupine caribou herd, which uh, has been eyed by oil companies as prospective oil field uh, drilling. So that's something I grew up with. And I think it's a lesson from our people, the way that our people believe is we should only take what we need from the land and whatever we take, we need to use all of it and also to share what we take and that's just a sign of respect to the animals, the caribou that give their lives for our nourishment and clothing and tools, all of these uh, traditional uses that um, our people use the caribou for. And <clears throat> it's perhaps a lesson, a, le a, a lesson or a message to the larger world that we have to live together on this earth and in a way that will ensure that there is a future for the land, for the animals. And I try to, in my work, think about uh, what, a, what kinds of messages are we sending out and what kind of stories are we telling and the playback form you hear a lot from a lot of different perspectives and I think that there's one thing that I really appreciate about playback is the inclusivity and you never know what story an audience member might share. There's a lot of different stories that I've heard and I've had the experience myself of sharing my own story and seeing it played back. That's a very profound experience just to hear, have your, your story heard and then portrayed and it's a, I guess I would call it transformative in a way and um, I think it is a unique form of theater that um, if you haven't experienced it seek it out because <laughs> it, it's, it's a very different approach to theater but I appreciate your time and thank you for listening I'll see you. Thank you, Alan. You gave us a lot to think about. James? Um, COVID for me has been surprisingly fruitful. Um, 
and not because of anything I did on my own. People came to me and asked me to help. And I said, yes. Um, I, I wrote a play with a collaborator that we just finished and a disability arts organization, not the one I'm associated with, asked me to write a play with them about institutionalization and persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That's been hard for me, um, not because I didn't know how to do it, not because I couldn't do it, but because as I delve into the stories of these people who are largely invisible to the world, I, I got depressed in trying to honor their stories and trying to share their stories and trying to um, um, be honest with their stories. And you know, I'm, I'm glad I've had, I, I, I hate Zoom. Let me be very honest. I hate Zoom. Um, I want to, I, I, that's why I thought live theater is so wonderful for me is I want to be in the same space with the people I'm participating with. But every week or every other week, the, a group of artists and activists have sat down with me, read my material, talked to me about what I was researching, listened to what I have to say, given me suggestions or the direction of this work of art. And it has kept me sane. Uh, it hasn't kept me happy. I've started therapy and I'm taking some medication for my anxiety and my depression, but it's kept me working and grounded and, and, and pushing forward. Um, that's the blessing. The, the sadness is I, you know, all my friends who have disabilities, many of them are immunocompromised. I can't go anywhere near them. Uh, you know, uh, not even with a mask on. Um, and these are people that I hug and cherish and um, that's been a real hardship. Um, and I don't know what else to say. Thank you for sharing uh, all, all three of you. I think um, I'm with you, James. I'm very tired of Zoom. I feel like I've reached my capacity some days of just staring at a screen. Um, and I think, right, listening to the three of you discuss the way that COVID has shifted both positive and negative, right? We have roses and thorns in thinking about what it means to be online. Um, but also thinking about the way that our bodies continue to be weaponized or othered in uh, these spaces, right? We have people who are still impacted that we can't visit, that we can't physically be around. Um, and then we still have BIPOC folks that are, are dying. And, um, and, the, and the past year, the way a mask has been weaponized, right? Uh, has been really um, frustrating in thinking about how do we care for each other, right? And um, coming back to what are the stories that we're telling? How are we centering um, those folks that might not be represented in the same way are facing systemic oppressions? Um, so I would like each of you to kind of discuss how you've continued to reimagine your relationships, um, however, whatever relationships, however relationships um, through your theater work. And, um, and it can be pre-pandemic 
or how, how you're imagining post-pandemic, how to reimagine these relationships. Because I think we all carry these intersecting identities and these intersecting experiences. So how, how have you continued to reimagine those relationships um, through your work? Oyeme. Uh, can you say the question one more time? Yeah, I also put it in the chat. So just how you have continued to reimagine your relationships through your theater work. So the just thinking about the shifts that have happened over the last year, but also considering um, the impact of this broader climate change. So just the way that you're continuing to reimagine relationships. You mean like relationships like with other theater makers and? Ha however you would like to, if it's with your community, with other theater makers, just, yeah, you can really, however you wanna take that question, it's really up to you. I think, um, so I recently um, had a, had a showing of a, of a play at the at the Guthrie and it was on their YouTube website and I mean it was I felt like it was so um it was so easy to just get the word out to people from my um from like places where I grew up like people I grew up with who maybe like um can't afford to go to the Guthrie and stuff like that or like or like if it wasn't on Zoom, maybe they wouldn't have gotten a chance to catch it and stuff. So it was just, it was just like, I feel like it's connected me to like the community that I really wanna connect to um, because it it's just like making it more accessible for people, I guess. Cause it's easier to just uh, be able to pull something up on your laptop versus having to go somewhere and like have to pay a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I feel like that that's been uh, beneficial, yeah. And it's been yeah. So I think I think that's been. And then also it's been helping me, like I, I said before, just because it's it's harder for me to go out of the house. Like I've been able to go to Zoom meetings with with people and meet people, like um, and also then people like from other country, like from other countries and other like states and, and stuff. Like I was able to connect with uh, the people for my residencies and stuff. And I wouldn't have been able to connect with them as easily because I'm in Minneapolis and they're in New York. So I feel like I'm able to get my word out better to my community, which are uh, black people from low income families um, uh, and, and neighborhoods. And I'm able to give my work out to them more easily and then I'm also able to connect with people in other states. Um, so I think in that way, it's been beneficial uh, for my environment and my relationships. Yeah. Thank you for that. And someone shared uh, your play in the chat. So if folks can check that out, that would be really great. I also think just, uh, what you said about accessibility, right? And that's one fear I have as things start to become in person, but at a limited amount is who will be able to access these things in person as we transition back, right? Um, so that, that gives me more to think about. Alan, what about you? How have you continued to reimagine? You've talked a lot about this, the playback, um, but also concerns with climate um, how how are you moving forward? Yeah, since this pandemic has set upon us, <laughs> I've been a part of several theater uh, productions, which uh, really were more like audio plays or radio plays. One with the Fairbanks Sh Shakespeare Theater, we did As You Like It just about a year ago. And that was when the pandemic first set in. And then last fall, working with the Soul Rep Theater in Karamia out of Dallas. That's something I probably wouldn't have done if it weren't for the pandemic. <laughs> you know, I connected with these companies through a mutual friend who recommended me. And we did a play called My Red Hand, My Black Hand. And <clears throat> that was 
really interesting, profound experience just in the fact that it was a collaboration of several theater companies on a story that I hadn't heard of. Um, it was the tale of a, a singed man and a woman from the South who connected through music and ended up falling in love and being married and partners and just through the uh, pressures from both their cultures ended up the relationship did not endure and it was just the, all the challenges that were before them um, but it was a powerful production and I was glad to have been a part of it and we, we've been um, creating new proposals with the Playback Theater Company. Uh, we call ourselves Breadcrumbs. And <clears throat> with this proposal, if we're funded, we hope in the next couple of years to be continuing to work with incarcerated populations um, at the Fairbanks Youth Facility or Fairbanks Correctional Center and to um, workshop the playback form and encourage those audiences to share their stories and to bring them out for other um, audiences to hear and experience. And also, I think just the process of sharing your own stories, is, it is very powerful and could really change one's life. You know, I think back in my own youth when I first got involved in theater was in college and I was 17 and ended up with the Thunderbird Theater in Haskell, uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And <clears throat> the experience, my own personal experience with theater, it really brought me out of my shell. It probably changed the direction of my life and through the course of my life has really taught me a lot. And, um, just about listening to others and seeing different points of view and um, opening my world and being aware of what else is happening in this world. And so I think theater is, is really a, a place that all of these stories can come together with uh, different stories. And there's so many different worlds that are possible in theater. I'm looking forward, like James just said about Going, getting back to live performance, I think that really is what theater is versus anything Zoom or virtual. You know, it's just not the same experience at all. But um, I'm just hopeful that you know we will return and continue. The theater will continue to be a place where stories can be shared and um, audiences can be impacted by them. Thank you, Ellen, especially sharing about your experience coming into theater and theater being transformative for your own life. Uh, James, was there anything you would like to add? I know you've touched upon um, kind of the relationships that you've built already during the pandemic and um, anything else you would like to, to contribute? I, I was under, uh, immediately under jet airplanes for six years in the Air Force. And I have hearing loss and tinnitus because of that. Um, but I didn't think, and, and was labeled disabled by the Air Force. It was a convenient, like I didn't, you know, it wasn't part of who I was until I started working with a disability arts organization and a group of disabled actors. I am disabled. I can say that today. Uh, yeah, it's gotten a little worse over the years, but these are my people now. I I'm one of them. And sharing my life with them and them sharing their lives with me has been, especially in this last year, as we've met weekly on Zoom to discuss how to write a play. And as I've met weekly with disabled 
creators to help me create a play of my own. I've, uh, it has become part of me that I am disabled as well. Um, that's the most valuable thing I've gotten out of this is I have a community now and that community is so valuable to me and um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by that. Thanks. Thank you, James. Um, so both Ellen and James, you you touched on kind of the impact of finding a theater community and the way theater has transformed you. Uh, Oya May, can can you add um, about your own experience in coming into theater and um, and expand on any anything? Yeah. So um, I actually. Um... I actually just kind of started writing when I was 20, when I was 23, um, I became, I, so I was, um, my goal was I wanted to be a professional boxer from like 14 to 19. And then I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And for a while I wanted to go into sociology and I learned a lot um, from sociology, but then, uh, I started getting really into writing and I use sociology um, like in my plays and stuff uh, just to look at um, like the different, well, to get words for all the things that I had been experiencing growing up in a like, you know, white supremacist culture and stuff. Um, so it helped me learn the words, but uh, so I, I kind of like this, this year and like in two, so in 2009, I got the, I, I got the I am soul residency at the National Black Theater. And um, before that, I was a finalist for the, for this Lark Fellowship that I now, um, I now won. So I'm, I'm kind of now getting to, uh, connect with more while well, I'm connecting with Tim Lord, who was the previous uh, um, receiver of the of the fellowship. So it's like I am because I got uh, both the resi residency and the fellowship, I'm now having the opportunity, I guess, to connect with people and by connecting with more theater people. I'm I'm just like um, I'm seeing all the different ways theater can be presented, like um, like live theater, but now um, like this this like whatever's going on right now too as well. Um, so it's just been really interesting having that, especially because like just a few years ago, I ne I would have never thought that I would be getting all the stuff that I'm getting right now. So. It's been a true blessing. Yeah, um, yeah. And then just to work with other, especially other disabled um, writers and playwrights and actors, that's been, that's been um, even a greater experience. So working with both black and now disabled. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. Congratulations on those fellowships too. Um, I think a lot of, so I guess I didn't in, say this in my introduction, but I'm a doctoral student right now. And a lot of my research is looking at the intersection of uh, place and land and culture with art. And for me, artists uh, reimagine and imagine futures that um, sometimes we can't quite grasp. Um, in our everyday life. And I think artists and theater makers and visual artists really um, see, see things that sometimes we can't see uh, in our, in our, you know, in our everyday. And so um, one thing that I really wanted to ask you all is uh, what are your hopes for the future um, and the way that theater has helped you think about the future? I'll put it in the chat. Um, and I'll just open this up if 
anyone wants to start with this question, um, you can just unmute yourself. I mean, I, I guess two words that come right to mind to me are um, transformative, uh, which means kind of taking what, what it is and sort of um, flipping it on its head and letting new people speak and then authentic. So like um, we hear these stories, like we hear these stories from like the real people who are actually going through them. We see actors who like who like portray these people that we are trying. I mean, like who portray these characters that we're trying to show. And I think that's very important um, when moving forward. And also. Um, like I like I like the ideas of, of imagining like a utopia, like people just like us coming together and just like imagining this utopia where we can all exist together with the environment in ways that we have never been able to, which is why I think then transformation is so important because what we need is something that has never happened. So in order for it to happen, I think we need to transform. Um, yeah, if that makes any sense. Thank you. I think that makes uh, perfect sense. Alan? Thank you, Oya. <clears throat> I was happy to see uh, you're involved with the Guthrie. That was the last place I saw an actual play <laughs> in the traditional sense, you know, pre-pandemic. I went to Twelfth Night there in February of last year. Um, I was traveling down to the Twin Cities area uh, to visit with a friend. And we got to see a lot of things that we take for granted or took for granted at the time, but aren't possible now, like the Twelfth Night at the Guthrie, or we went to see Michelle and Dago Cello at um, the Paisley Park stage. And uh, all the museums as well were still open at that point, and restaurants. and. You know, um, just the experience of entering a theater and finding your seat and sitting and waiting. For, you see the set there and the lights and music and waiting for the show to start. And that show started with a, a land acknowledgement. And I wasn't expecting that. And it was very, uh, it just had an impact on me and my, my friend as well. She's uh, Lakota and Tlingit. She lives there in St. Paul, and we were just uh, very appreciative that they took that step. And, and the, the cast was wonderful. They, you know, did a fantastic job. It's really quite something to experience live theater and the quality that they produced there at the Guthrie was wonderful. And I just my hope for the future is to have uh, theater again and. Um, I know many companies are finding ways to adapt, but um, until we get audiences together and sitting in a live theater space, you know, that to me would be uh, a wonderful thing to see again. And I'm I'm interested to hear how the theater will change. You know, to what kind of stories will be shared on stages after this experience we've been through together it's still not over you know there's still parts of the world that are it's just raging a, a wildfire and i think it is connected to global climate change and you know it's it's really one big event <laughs> all of these things that are happening in the world today the climate change global warming loss of language and ecology and environment I really see it as just one giant event. You know, we try to compartmentalize it and separate it out, just maybe it's just to try and deal with the immensity of it. But um, I don't think we can avoid being impacted by it. And we do need to take action. And I hope more people will come to that understanding that in order for us to continue to be together on this, this planet this little speck in the universe. Um, we do make, need to make accommodation and changes in our lives. And 
I don't know what form that will take, but uh, I hope that we are able to meet the challenge. So I'll see, thank you. Um, in, in 1963, I was in third grade. And in school, a horn went off and they, unlike usual, we didn't line up out in the hall and march outside. They told us to crawl under our desks. I lived in South Denver. And um, this was my first air raid drill, warning that a nuclear bomb was about to strike nearby. At By the time I was 17, I did not believe I would grow up to be 30. I assumed that the world would be destroyed. Um, somewhere in my late 30s, 40s, that, that finally left me. But that's also when climate change began to be a reality, began to be talked about in, in public ways. I don't, I have grandchildren. I don't want them to grow up thinking they're not gonna live to be 30. I don't want them growing up thinking that the best is behind them. I want them to have a future. I want them, you know, I am a very privileged man. I know that. Everyone should have the privilege I have had. But especially our children. I want that. I, I, I've spent my life working with children and I just... I don't want them to go through what I went through, fearing that they weren't going to grow up or that if they did grow up, it was going to be horrible. That's my hope for the future. Thank you, James, and thank you all. Uh, I think about in my own community, um, a lot of Lakota communities talk about a seven generations, right? Seven generations behind someone made a decision or made plans to ensure that I would be here and, and living and surviving. Um, and so that I, ne I need to make choices and lay plans so that seven generations after me. Um, and it's terrifying to think about what seven generations down the road will look like um, for our descendants. Uh, so there's a, a few folks have shared um, different uh, documentaries and also um, resources that reflect um, disability images and disability representation. Uh, and so I and I think about your reflection, Alan, about a land acknowledgement at the beginning of a play and the way that has shifted your experience of that play. And I think about our uh, kind of discussion today and in the ways that we want to see ourselves reflected, but also in the, how we see ourselves reflected in the future. So um, if you all can just describe the, maybe a, a time when the impact of seeing yourself reflected on stage of, of, an, of one of a part of your identity and just what are ways that we can continue making that type of impact so that we can continue to see ourselves reflected on stage. Um, so I don't know, Ellen, if you can <laughs> expand on how how you see your work impacting future generations or the ways that you would like to see other theater makers or theater companies um, reflecting indigenous narratives. Sure, yeah. I remember growing up 
what we we didn't have theater so much in Alaska, but we did have um, film, and a lot of the films we saw were the ones that depicted Native Americans were um, kind of you know dehumanized and savage and. Uh, there were some exceptions, maybe Little Big Man, or uh, I'm trying to think of others, Smoke Signals, that was more when I was an adult, but um, where there were a human character behind the story. I think um, that is when I could relate most to the, the depiction I was seeing on the screen or on the stage was just the human element. And I, I hope that those type of stories can continue to be told and to step away from any kind of stereotypes and generalizations, but to really get to the human story at the core of it and bring that forth. Um, a lot of times the things we see on stage are the projections of someone else that you know don't really understand who you are but there, there are times when, when you see something and can really connect with it and relate to it. I really appreciate that. Um, and I hope that the work I do has that, you know, consciousness about it that um, I could be, <laughs> there's, there've been people who've come up to me and said, yeah, I saw you on stage. And <laughs> I hope that, you know, that experience for them was, you know, uh, something that might inspire them to get involved and to maybe audition for a play and to um, test it out and overcome that fear and step out there because it is terrifying to get on stage in front of a bunch of strangers and to even share someone else's story or you know to really step out there it takes a lot of bravery and I hope that others will you know, be able to have that experience. Like James says, it's, it's a very privileged experience. Not everyone has it, but um, you know, just to have that experience being out there on the ledge you know, in front of an audience. And it's live theater, so a lot of things could happen. And, uh, that's just my hope. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Oya May, what about you? You can also describe the impact of writing a reflection of yourself or your community on stage. Can you say the question one more time for me? Yes. Uh, so just thinking about uh, the impact of seeing a reflection of yourself on stage uh, mm -hmm. and just describing the impact of that. Yeah, I think so the, the time where I felt that uh, the most. I can't remember where it was, but it was a small theater and they did uh, for for colored women who have could consider suicide when the rainbow is not enough. And I remember I remember just watching it and it was after I kind of went through um, a sexual assault and just seeing like black femmes on on stage talking about this stuff and living and continuing to go on after that, it just like, it really breath, uh, blessed my soul and made me it made me feel whole when I saw that. And I think as a black, black family, that's not something that, that is shown a lot in, in this society and not a feeling that I get to feel a lot. So getting the opportunity to feel that was just everything for me. Um, and I hope it, I hope it continues to happen. Um, yeah. Thank you. James, is there anything you'd like to add? Groucho. What you're seeing is the normal sensible me. What I am in real life is more like Groucho. And, and what I aspire to be is more like Groucho. Um, you know, that their, their work on stage became their work on in film. And 
the entertainment they brought. You know, I want to be an entertainer. Yes, I yes, I've written plays about climate change and about disability and about all kinds of things. But if people aren't entertained, I have failed as a writer. Um, and and very few people have ever entertained me the way Groucho entertains me. Um, and if I could be half that much of an entertainer, my life would be fulfilled. Thank you, James. Uh, it reminds me of uh, talent, right? A lot of and not to generalize, but a lot of indigenous tribal storytelling, there has to be a call and response, right? Um, in the black communities, right? There's a call and response or Kanaka Mali communities, right? We'd like to talk stories. So um, thinking about this ability to be able to engage with an audience that understands where you're coming from. And I think listening to all of you reflect on your experiences, it's really, uh, exciting to think about how we engage with audiences that then um, normalize our bodies and normalize our experiences and not have to see it from a deficit or see it um, as extraordinary that what we're experiencing is an everyday experience um, in different types of communities. So we have about 10 minutes left of discussion. Um, and I just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions for our panelists, um, to just put it, you can either put a question in the Padlet, or you can direct message me a question. Uh, and then I'm just going to turn back to our panelists and see if there are any final thoughts or anything you would like to include as we um, come near the end of our conversations. Uh, anyone like to add any stories or any reflections? Um, I guess just one thing with me, I uh, just like through getting to um, getting the opportunity to do this fellowship at the Lark, I have um wanted to create a piece that is like a one-man show but it's going to be my spirit or soul um i call him my spirit i mean my soul um tino and he's my nightmare um are my soul and i want to make a um a piece surrounding him and for a long time i was afraid to do this just because I was afraid of how my body would look on stage as a disabled femi. But through him, I'm able to, um, and through him and through understanding uh, the love of my body as a disabled person, I have um, wanted to start performing, which was something I was always scared of doing. So that's been helping me getting the chance to connect with people and honor my body as a disabled person and honor my, uh, my souls as well. Yeah. Well, currently I'm a part of a Alaska theater writers group and we've been meeting uh, regularly online and each of us have had different stories in mind and ideas and it's really inspiring to hear what others are doing. I've, I've, I'm a novice at writing. I've been an actor for many years, but to actually step into the role of a writer is a very different experience. And, you know, I just hope that whatever uh, the outcome is that the stories I'm able to uh, generate will actually stand a chance to compete against, you know, uh, you have an audience and they come into the theater and their real lives right now are just so, so elevated, you know, like how can you present a theater production after the experiences we've been through with this pandemic that will um, be able to compete? <laughs> you know, the, it's, and we're just entering, I think, a lot of uh, new territory with 
our our world and how can we tell stories that will uh, be able to move audiences because there's such extreme uh, events happening and <clears throat> theater I think will change because of all these things that are happening the, the way that we tell stories and present them I'm interested in seeing what will be down the road in that department. I, Alan said he's going from performer to writer. I am my tilt has uh, decided to put me on stage. <laughs> I have resisted this my whole life. I have uh, struggled with anxiety and I, I acted some as a youth, but it, it was I, it was I was too anxious to enjoy it. Um, but they are putting me on stage for a, a, a play we've been writing. It's a, it's a bunch of short pieces. I wrote a short piece as an example, and they said, nope, that's got to be in the show. Um, and I'm reluctant, but I will be doing it. I, Alan, I under I feel your pain <laughs> as you think about trans changing. And OMA, you'll be beautiful on stage. Thank you all for for reflecting on these shifts and these transitions of how we're understanding our bodies on stage and, and writing our bodies on stage and also writing our spirits. OMA, I think that's such a, a wonderful kind of visual to think about um, how to represent yourself and how you feel comfortable, right, James? Sometimes we get voluntold to do things and we have to do them by our community and um, that, that voluntelling is really important. Um, and I think, I really appreciate hearing you all reflect on, on these intersections and thinking about the shifts that we hope are, are coming for our community. So um, we are almost at time and I haven't seen any questions yet. So y'all must have done really well in addressing a lot of the issues that our audience wanted to. Um, there's some comments uplifting you, Oyame in the chat and Alan and James. Uh, so definitely if folks wanna, oh, I would also open our panelists. How can we find out more information about your work? So we'll, I'll throw it to Oyame if you wanna tell us where we can find your work or if you have any social media handles you'd like to share. Uh. Yeah, I got a I got an Instagram and it's just uh, I think it's it's the Oya May. Um, I'm going to have some stuff at the National Black Theater. I am doing the I am Soul residency and then also later I'm going to have some stuff at the Lark Theater as well. I also have a website. Uh, it's my real name, Drusella Davis .com. So any of those places would be a great place to find more of my work. Yeah. Alan. Blossom House, it's our umbrella organization that um, the Breadcrumbs Theater is a part of. So you could visit blossomhouse.org and that will give you some information about Blossom House, but also uh, Breadcrumbs Theater. James? I put a link in chat to Tilt Performance Group. Um, you'll find me on the board of directors. Other than that, you probably won't see me. You'll see my friends and colleagues. Um, and you can look at some performances, um, so at least some snippets from performances. And um, uh, I've got works on New Play Exchange if you're interested in looking. Awesome. So I'm going to call 
Sarah back out here to close us out. Clementine, where can the people find you? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I will drop my website in the chat. Amazing. And while Clementine is doing that, I'm actually going to invite our audience members to turn on their videos and their microphones and just show some love to our panelists and to thank them so much um, for sharing with us today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much to our audience for joining us as well. Um, we encourage all of you to keep the conversation going on Mighty Networks. And in the chat, I'm also going to just quickly drop a feedback form if I can figure out what I did with it. Um, so uh, yeah, your feedback helps us um, program for events. And so we would really appreciate if you would take a moment to fill this out as well. Um, so just one more time, I want to say thank you so much to our panelists and to Clementine for moderating this conversation. Um, we so appreciate all of you and your work and to seeing, here's to seeing your work in person or over Zoom in the future. Thank, thank you, you, Clementine. I'm like, what can't you just let my edges be out? I can if you want me to. I mean, what's